Hello and welcome. My name is Nurana Nimpuno and I'm the Head of Global Engagement at the London Internet Exchange, LINX. And today we're going to talk about peering. So, when learning about the internet, you might have come across the terms tier one, tier two and tier three providers. And while they're not official or clearly defined terms, they're useful to know in order to understand the topology of the internet. So let's start with a tier one provider. A tier one provider is generally a large international network that has access to the full internet. And it has that through its own network, but also by peering, exchanging traffic with other large tier one providers. So a tier one provider does not have to pay another party to reach parts of the internet, because in fact, it's in the business of selling access to the internet to a smaller provider. So a tier two network is a network that generally buys transit from a tier one provider, and it might also be selling on some of that transit to smaller networks. It might also have some peering arrangements where it exchanges traffic with other networks for free and for the mutual benefits of both parties. And a tier three network is generally used for a network that is simply connected through one single connection to the internet. So what does transit then actually mean? Well, transit just means that you allow network to cross or to transit your own network. So that's usually used as a term for a large provider to provide connectivity to a smaller provider. And technically that's two things. So it's both taking the traffic from that provider and sending it on to the rest of the internet, but also reaching other parts of the internet and sending that traffic back to the smaller provider. So in simple terms, it's just a small ISP letting a large ISP manage the traffic exchange. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you let the third party manage your whole network, but it means that any traffic that leaves your network and goes onto the larger provider's network is managed by them. So as a network matures, it might want to look at other options than just having one single connection to the internet through a transit provider. And that's where it might be looking at peering. It might pull a private cable between itself and another network and do what's called private interconnection, or it might in fact do public peering at a public internet exchange point. So most networks have a multitude of different connections. It might have some transit that it buys from a transit provider, it might have a few private interconnections, and it might also do public peering at a public internet exchange point. And there are a few advantages of peering at a public exchange point that we'll look a little bit closer at. It keeps the internet traffic local, it gives you control over your routing, and it also gives you the opportunity to lower your costs and improve the performance of your traffic exchange. So do all networks at an exchange point automatically exchange traffic with everyone else at the exchange? Well, no, because when you peer, whether you do it through private interconnection or at a public internet exchange point, you take control over your routing. You decide with whom and under what circumstances your networks will exchange traffic. In order to describe that, we have something called peering policies. A peering policy is something that describes how a network manages connections to other networks. And by putting that on a public website or in a public peering database, it helps other networks understand the requirements for peering with that network. If you're a very large provider, you might have several different networks that each have different peering policies, depending on the needs and how you use those networks. So peering policies normally fall into three categories, open, selective, and restrictive. Open means that the network will generally peer with anyone. Selective means that the network will peer if certain requirements are met. And restrictive means that they will probably not peer with anyone else, unless for in some exceptional circumstances. And traditionally, as networks grew, they were considered to go through different peering phases. 
a very small network that just started peering, would generally have an open peering policy as their intention was to reduce the amount of traffic that they sent through a transit provider and that they were paying for. And if they could exchange that traffic directly with the network they're trying to reach, that would be a good cost saving for them. As they grew, they might move into more of a selective peering phase where they could find that they achieved the same results by not peering with everyone, but only with a few. And they might also add some requirements for peering. And then if they grew beyond that to a large international network, they might even become a T1 provider and not peer with anyone really at all as they were in the business of selling access to um, the internet. But this is a little bit of a traditional view because really peering policy comes down to not just the size of your network, but the individual characteristics of that network. Peering policies are not just shaped by the engineering department, but by sales and product managers as well, because it comes down to the business and technical needs of that network and organization. So when you look at how to define your peering policy, you need to look at what your traffic profiles are like, what the priorities are for your organization and your network. You might want to look at things like cost, performance, latency, and what your network actually looks like and who it's connected to. So let's take a closer look at the different peering policies. So let's start by looking at open peering policies. Open peering policies are quite common among networks that have traffic profiles that are very imbalanced, be it inbound or outbound. And these networks are often present at the Internet Exchange Point's root server and will peer with anyone who's connected to that root server. It's common among networks who don't have an overwhelming market share or have lower traffic volumes. So for example, a smaller ISP wants to cut the transit costs. But it can also be a very large content provider who wants to exchange traffic with access providers in order to get that content as close to the end user as possible. And in some cases, it's networks that are more concerned with performance than the top line revenue. But again, it depends on the type of network we're talking about. So selective peering policies are very common, and that can be, for example, a carry network that has a traffic profile that's very balanced, a network that has significant market share, and that's more concerned with top line revenue than performance. But again, it depends on the network, and selective can simply also mean that we will peer with you if you meet these very basic minimum requirements. So those types of requirements can be minimum amount of locations that you have. It can be a minimum amount of traffic that you have in order for it to make sense for them to peer with you. It can be things like consistent routing. If you peer at several locations, you want to make sure that the routing is consistent across all those peering locations. And it can also be simple technical requirements like a 24 seven knock. So they want to make sure that you have a certain amount of quality management of your network and that they can get a hold of you if something breaks. And then finally, restrictive peering policy. That's very common about among large carry networks that have very balanced traffic profiles. It can be networks that are very close to monopolistic market shares like carriers and tier one providers and networks that are more concerned with top line revenue than performance. So why do networks peer? Well, we've covered quite a few of the reasons already. Reduced operating costs can be a big one if you're a small network relying entirely on an upstream provider for your interconnectivity. If you can take a portion of that traffic that you're paying for and instead exchange it at an exchange point directly with the networks you're trying to reach and doing it for free, then that can reduce your operating costs. Improved routing is another one because if you exchange traffic directly with those networks, you can decide how that traffic is being exchanged. And distribution of traffic is the third one because if you peer with many different networks at an exchange point, you can improve your ability to scale. 
So there are a few other reasons as well. So improved performance, quality and reliability. And this comes back to controlling how your traffic is being routed. Because by having that control, you can avoid potential bottlenecks and find a more direct optimized path. Keeping internet traffic local is important, particularly if you've got content that you want to send to end customers. You want to do that in the most optimized way possible. So you might not want to pass that on to a third party and risk having that content leave the region or the country. So instead, by peering at an exchange point directly with those access providers who have those customers, you can optimize the delivery of that content. In some cases, networks peer for other non-technical reasons so as to appear larger than they actually are and to increase the billable customer traffic. And then, of course, a strong reason to peer at an exchange point is that it's a very simple and efficient way of peering with lots of different networks. So when you decide to peer at an IXP, it comes down to the needs of your network and your organization. So it varies greatly depending on what type of network you are, whether you're a CDN, an access provider, a tier two, tier one provider or an enterprise. And in fact, we see many enterprise customers are now understanding peering and connecting to Exchange Point to reduce their cost and to take control over their routing. So let's say you're a network who's decided to peer. But how do you then actually select which internet exchange point to peer at? Well, again, it comes down to the unique needs of your organization and your network. But let's look at a few different factors to consider. So one of the first things that many networks look at when connecting to an IXP is how many AS numbers, as in how many other unique networks are present at the IXP. Because that will give you an indication of how much peering you can get out of the IXP. But then it's important to dig a little bit deeper and look at which AS numbers are peering there, what their peering policies are, and what type of AS numbers they are. Because again, your peering needs might differ from others. In some cases, people are after particular services that are being offered at the IXP and that you can simply access just by being present at the IXP. Of course, the cost of connecting to the IXP is important as well, but you want to look at the full picture. So you also want to look at location, data center, the cost of the co-location and circuits, etc. And that will give you the full cost picture in order to decide whether or not it's worth your while. In some cases, there are networks that don't want to put equipment in the location where the IXP is, and they might want to consider remote peering using another larger provider to get to the IXP. So those are a few of the factors that you look at when peering at an IXP. So to sum it up, peering at an IXP gives you better control over your routing. It keeps local traffic local. It allows you to improve the performance of your traffic exchange and lower the latency and improve the speed. And of course, peering at an IXP is a very simple and efficient way of exchanging traffic with many other networks on the internet. That was my brief introduction to peering. I hope you found it useful. Make sure to check out some of the other Lynx educational videos as well. Thank you and goodbye.